beginning of the 20th century, Russia was on the verge of immolation. The life of the country was paralyzed by the Industrial Recession, a long bloody war, and a blockade. By the end of the summer of 1918, three quarters of the country's territory was under the control of foreign and white guard troops. 14 states and hundreds of thousands of foreign troops took part in the intervention against Russia. The only center of resistance to the advancing troops of the invaders and their allies was Soviet Russia. In this video, we will tell you about the goals of the foreign intervention and from what fate the communists save Russia. Right after the October Revolution, Soviet power found itself in a difficult situation. The First World War was going on. The initiative of the Soviet government to conclude universal peace was faced with active opposition from both sides. The difficult situation of the Central Powers, led by Germany, forced them, despite their class hatred of the Soviet Republic, to seek a truce with it. The Entente sought to keep Russia in the war for the sake of the interests of British, French, and American capitalists. But not only the military issue bothered the former allies of Russia. Even before the war, the British and French capitalists invested heavily in the Russian Empire's economy. With the advent of the Bolsheviks, who transferred the banks and large-scale industry to the people's property, these capitals were threatened. In addition, the foreign bourgeoisie was afraid of the revolutions spreading across Europe and sought to prevent the establishment and strengthening of the socialist state in Russia. In December 1917, the imperialists of England and France concluded a secret agreement on the division of Russia into spheres of influence. According to these plans, the British were to receive the Don, Kuban, Caucasus, Central Asia, and the northern part of the Russian European territory, and France would get Ukraine, Crimea, and Bessarabia. Later, the United States joined these plans, advocating for the complete partition and division of Russia. The most important task of the young Soviet state was to get out of the imperialist war and conclude peace without annexations or contributions. Germany outwardly supported this idea, but when the Soviet delegation demanded the liberation of the occupied territories, the German imperialists refused and went on the offensive. In response to this, the Soviet government issued a decree, the Socialist Fatherland is in danger, and began the building of the Workers' and Peasants' Red Army. Near Pskov and Narva, the heroic resistance of the first detachments of the Young Red Army halted the advance of the German troops, and in honor of this event, the 23rd of February was proclaimed Red Army Day. On March 5, 1918, the Brest-Litovsk Treaty was signed between Russia and Germany. This agreement, despite the difficult conditions for the country, saved the Soviet Republic from defeat in a war that was obviously unfavorable for it. However, Germany continued to be a formidable enemy for Russia. The German imperialists ruled in the Baltic states, Belarus, Ukraine, and the Caucasus, and helped to suppress the revolution in Finland. In the spring of 1918, they invaded the Crimea, the Tanman Peninsula, and Georgia. The White Guard chieftain Krasnov declared the independence of the Don and started buying German weapons in exchange for food. Nevertheless, the enemies of the revolution were unable to crack down on Soviet power with the help of German bayonets. Now, they sought support from the Entente. In March 1918, troops from the United States, Britain, and France landed in Murmansk. In April, the Japanese occupied Vladivostok. In May, the rebellion of the Czechoslovak Corps began, which moved east along the Trans-Siberian Railway. Together with the White Guard detachments, Czechoslovak troops captured Penza, Sizran, Semera, Chelyabinsk, Olmsk, Tomsk, and Krasnoyarsk, carrying out robberies and massacres in each captured city. With the Entente's support, anti-Bolshevik governments were created in the occupied territories and immediately unleashed terror against the entire pro-Soviet population, restoring bourgeois landlord order and forming their armed forces. Due to the direct intervention of foreign powers, a civil war began to rage throughout Russia. Most of the country fell into the hands of the interventionists and their accomplices. 
of the nearly 5,500 enterprises that previously carried out military contracts, 3,500 were captured by the enemy. Under the leadership of Lenin, the Central Committee of the Party and the Council of People's Commissars developed a combat program to mobilize all forces and means to defend the socialist fatherland. The whole country was now declared a military camp. Hundreds of thousands of workers and peasants volunteered for the Red Army. About half of the entire composition of the Bolshevik Party also went to the front. The transition from a voluntary principle to obligatory military service in a short time increased the number of the Red Army to one million people. As a result of the measures taken, the first successes appeared. The German henchman Adaman Krasnov, the commander of the Don Army, was driven back from Tsaritsyn and thrown back behind the Don. The White Guards and interventionists were expelled from Kazan, Simbirsk, and Samara, retreating to the Urals. The situation of the Soviet Republic changed with the defeat of Germany in the First World War. Under these conditions, the Soviet government annulled the predatory Brest Peace and issued an order to send troops for the liberation of Ukraine, Belarus, and the Baltic states. However, the defeat of Germany complicated the international situation. Characterizing it, Lenin spoke at the 6th All-Russian Congress of Soviets. We have never been in such a dangerous situation as we are now. The imperialists were busy among themselves, but now one group has been wiped out by the Anglo-French-American group, which considers its main task to be the extermination of world Bolshevism and the strangulation of its main center, the Russian Soviet Republic. Now, with their hands free in the West, the Entente could send more forces to Russia. Instead of German troops, interventionist troops came from the USA, France, Italy, Poland, Great Britain, and its dominions. They deployed their fleet in the Black Sea and the Baltic. The Soviet Republic was surrounded from almost all sides. By strikes from the East, South, and Northwest, the interventionists intended to unite the centers of internal counter-revolution and destroy Soviet Russia. The Entente placed the main hope on Admiral Kolchak. Only the United States, at the end of 1918, supplied him with more than 200,000 rifles, as well as machine guns, artillery, and ammunition. In the first half of 1919, they delivered another 250,000 rifles, several thousand machine guns, and several hundred artillery pieces. The almost 300,000-man army of Kolchak moved across the Urals to Moscow. Its back was provided by over 100,000 British, French, American, Japanese, and Czechoslovak troops. In the spring of 1919, Kolchak's army almost reached the Volga. The best forces of the Bolsheviks were poured against the advancing White Guards. The Red Army inflicted a number of defeats on Kolchak's troops and liberated the Urals and Siberia from the Whites, where the Red Army was supported by the powerful partisan movement that arose in the rear of the Whites. Meanwhile, the interventionists were preparing to deliver a combined strike from the West and the South. General Udenich was to divert attention of the Red Army by an attack on Petrograd. The interventionists planned to raise rebellions at the forts around Petrograd and the city itself. With the support of workers and sailors, the rebellious fortresses were liberated from the Whites, the plot of Petrograd was uncovered, and Udenich was driven back to Estonia. General Denikin was advancing from the south, receiving foreign weapons, uniforms, and ammunition. The main goal of his offensive was Moscow. In the fierce battles of the fall of 1919, the Red Army managed to crush the White Guards and drive them south, to Crimea. At this time, turmoil began in the Army of Interventionists. The soldiers, tired of the hardships of the war and unwilling to continue the war against the Red Army, raised the anti-war demonstrations and uprisings. At the beginning of February 1919, British soldiers in Murmansk set fire to their own warehouses, and at the end of March, a detachment of American infantry refused to carry out an order to move from Arkhangelsk to the front. In the spring, in Odessa, French soldiers revolted under the leadership of André Marti. Despite the most sincere censorship, information about revolutionary disturbances among the occupying forces became known to the peoples of the Entente countries, weary of war, which contributed to the intensification of protests against intervention. 
Discontent was also ripening in the metropolitan countries. The French, German, and Italian workers refused to load equipment for the White Guards, and the English movement, Hands Off Russia, acquired a nationwide scale. Almost 8 million people took part in strikes, organized in support of the Soviet Republic. The peaceful respite after the feat of Kolchak and Denikin did not last long. The imperialists began a new campaign against Soviet Russia. The Entente managed to bring Poland, the remnants of the White Guard troops in the Crimea, and the Petalura gangs in Ukraine into the war. On April 25, 1920, Polish forces launched an offensive. The troops in the western and southwestern fronts, three times less in number, were forced to retreat, leaving Kyiv. The Soviet Republic was forced again to mobilize its forces and repulse the interventionists. This time, the White Guard forces in Crimea became more active. Great Britain hoped to turn Crimea into its base on the Black Sea. In addition, France joined the English sponsors of Wrangel. For the sake of continuing to get military supplies, Wrangel signed an agreement which would result in a loss of Russian sovereignty and drive it in to complete bondage. For example, according to the agreement, Russia was obliged to pay all debts to France to transfer three quarters of oil and gasoline production, as well as a quarter of the coal mined at the Donetsk region for 35 years. The Entente tried to link the actions of Wrangel with the actions of Poland, but ran into serious contradictions between them. Meanwhile, the Soviet Republic launched a strategic counterattack to the west and southwest, causing panic among the imperialists. France strengthened the military supply of the Polish army, but Poland, exhausted by the war and torn by internal class contradictions, was forced to make peace with Soviet Russia. The cessation of hostilities with Poland made it possible to concentrate the main forces for the defeat of the last White Guard troops. With the defeat of Wrangel, the armed struggle against counter-revolution and intervention in most of the country was completed. And although the military question ceased to be the main one, there were still separate centers of counter-revolution and intervention in Transcaucasia, Central Asia, and the Far East. The fight against the White Guard gangs and interventionists in the Far East went on until 1922. If the British and French troops left immediately, as the Red Army began to advance through Siberia, then the 100,000th Japanese Army would try to squeeze the maximum resources from the Far East. Only the defeat of the gangs of the White Baron Ungern in Transbaikalia, as well as the defeat of the White Guards in the Volochaev and Primorsky operations, would force the Japanese invaders to evacuate their last troops. Describing that historical period, Comrade Stalin says, The imperialists were inclined to depict the struggle of Denikin and Kolchak, Udenich and Wrangel, against the revolution in Russia as an exclusively internal struggle. But we all know, and not only we, but the whole world, that behind these counter-revolutionary Russian generals stood the imperialists of Britain and America, France and Japan, without whose support a serious civil war in Russia would have been quite impossible. In summation, it's safe to say that Russia was threatened with the complete loss of independence. The counter-revolution had everything necessary for this, control over areas with abundant food, support from the leading powers of the world, numerous armies, experienced commanders, and modern weapons. The imperialists of England, France, Japan, and the United States were preparing to divide the territory of the former Russian Empire among themselves, and their agreements with the White Guards leave no doubt. If they had won, Russia would have become a colony of the leading states. Only Soviet power and the Bolshevik party, which had the support of the majority of the working people and expressed their interests, stood in the way of the capitalists. Having organized the Red Army and rebuilt all economic life on war footing, Soviet Russia withstood an unprecedented battle against international capital and showed the working people of the world an example of a selfless struggle against imperialism. Stay tuned.